I have loose notes to keep me more or less in order, but otherwise uh, not much of a script, so it's, I can't really lose my place. <laughs> so if you have questions, feel free to ask at any point. I, I, I would much rather you ask now rather than wait till the end when you've forgotten the question. Um, as, and as Ryan mentioned, the people today think of Smithfield as just a little area around this house. I tend to work with what I call Greater Smithfield because the what you see right what we see right now is a remnant of the original plantation, which is now it was at some point in the 1840s divided into three plantations. So Solitude there around the duck pond, people many people at Virginia Tech are familiar with that because it's right on the campus. Smithfield here in the middle, and then across 460, um, invisible from here is Whitethorn, which was the western portion. So it's all, I think of it all as one big Smithfield plantation. But it was a long time. Yes, it, it was from 1774 when William Preston arrived here, approximately 1774, until the death of his son, James Patton Preston, died in 1843. Um, when he died, he had three sons, and he divided it so that um, William Ballard Preston occupied Smithfield, uh, James Francis Preston was at Whitethorn, and Robert Taylor Preston was over at, at Solitude. So for most of its history, it was one big plantation. It was then only divided up to the in the late 1840s. During that time, from approximately 1774 until 1865, when slavery in Virginia, or at least slavery in this part of Virginia, uh, was ended, at least 225 individuals were enslaved here. Um, probably more, certainly more, but I have to, I've only been able to identify uh, concretely two, at least 225 that I can identify by name. The, their origins are quite mixed. The, the first 16, uh, William Preston, the first enslaved workers that we know, that we know he purchased he purchased in 1759. He went up to Maryland where a slave ship called the True Blue had come in. The people on that ship had come from uh, the coast of what's now Ghana and were probably from a variety of different ethnic groups in Western, probably what is now um, Eastern Ghana. Uh, after that, Pres the, the William Preston and his descendants continued buying enslaved workers some of whom may have been directly from Africa, many of whom would have been, at that point, born in this country. And so most of the individuals who were enslaved here were second generation, third generation, fourth generation African Americans. From, originally from, this is a, a, probably a mix of African nations, and what generally happened on plantations, and probably happened here at Smithfield, was that the enslaved workers developed their own community that was a mix of different African customs, religions, even languages, and overlaying that with the English and, and American customs that their owners demanded of them. So it's, it's a true hybrid community of both African and American elements and people. And, and of course, the 225 were never here all at one time. The, the largest single population here would have been probably at the death of James Patton Preston uh, in the 1840s when there were 91. Uh, when he died, there were 91 individuals enslaved here. Taken together, the three plantations were about 150 slaves uh, at, their, at their peak. But on one plantation, uh, never more than uh, 90 or 95. But that's, I want you just to remember that because the many people in Southwest Virginia think, oh, slavery was here only on you know, a few body servants, little uh, small operations. No, they, there were big plantations in Montgomery County, including the Preston's plantations. This was a full um, southern plantation system. It's not a tobacco plantation. Uh, in spite of our being in Virginia, the Preston's never grew tobacco here. So mo when, when, when William Preston came here, most of the men probably worked growing flax. Uh, the American, just as, just as Preston got started here, the American Revolution broke out. There was great demand for, not black, it was hemp, excuse me. Um, great demand for rope for the, for the, for the Marine and, and the Navy. And what, what the Prestons grew was hemp that was then turned into rope. 
They didn't grow very good hemp in Virginia, though. And so as soon as the revolution was over, the demand dropped. They switched to growing wheat and cattle. And so most of the plant, most of the work here, most of the men working here would have been raising wheat, caring for cattle, also raising corn to feed themselves and the, the cattle and the family. Um, smaller crops of other items uh, as well. The, the, main, the main money crops were, were cattle and uh, wheat. Women, of course, did work in the fields when the uh, har when time to do the harvest, all hands on deck for, for working in the fields. But generally, women would have worked in domestic chores around the house, They're caring for children, uh, fixing food, working in the kitchen, doing the laundry. Uh, that sort of domestic labor was, there were also men doing that uh, from time to time, but, but it was often a sexual, divi a gender division of labor that the men did most of the outdoor work, the women did the indoor work. And of course, everything you see that dates from that era was built by enslaved workers. Smithfield was literally, you know, they say established by William Preston, but it was built by people enslaved by William Preston. Work did not end at the house or on the plantation. Um, one of the elements of owning a slave was taking, often taking those enslaved workers with you as body servants. So individuals from Smithfield would have gone to Richmond when Ballard Preston was in, in uh, the House of Delegates there. They would have traveled around with uh, women who went to Richmond for shopping. Children went to school in Richmond or up in Lexington and often took servants with them. And when men went to war, they took servants. Uh, one of the, the owner of, of um, Whitethorn, James, James Francis Preston, went both into the Mexican War and into the American Civil War with, in the Confederate Army. And each time he took with him a man named Taylor McNorton, who served as a cook and servant uh, for a year and a half in Mexico and for two years in Virginia prior to James Francis Preston dying. So slavery was a, oh, they were also hired out. Uh, so they often didn't just stay here to work. Um, men in particular were hired out to work on the railroad uh, when the railroad was built through here, it was built with slave labor. And most of the slaves that built it were hired from the various plantations. Preston also uh, regularly rented slaves to, in this part of Southwest Virginia are a number of small iron foundries. And making iron required an enormous amount of labor to cut uh, firewood, turn the wood into charcoal, to dig and break up limestone and to dig iron ore and then carry all that and load it into the furnace. And so men from Smithfield were sometimes hired to work in, in the coal field or in the uh, iron works. So their work day was a, a range of activities year round. You know, the, one of the <coughs> characteristics of a plantation like this where it's mixed agriculture is there's always something to do. Crops were on different schedules, cattle had to be fed every day, Fences had to be fixed, off roofs had to be fixed. There was something to do every day, male or female. But that's their work life. Uh, and that's the part that people have known about for, for years. What I've been most interested in, what I'm going to talk about for a while now, are the individuals who were enslaved here, the, 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 the people of Smithfield beyond the Prestons. And this is something I wish I knew more. The, of the 225 who were enslaved here, those are the people to whom I can give a name. But even those 225, only about a quarter of them do I really know their, their life history. Um, I know, for example, four or five of the families that were here. There were others that I can't put a name on. But I know, for example, the Fraction family. Uh, oh, there she is, Kira's, Kira's family. Uh, were probably here from the start. I, I wish that William Preston had written down the names of the first 16 he purchased, but he, he did not. But I think that one of them was a man named Jack Fraction, uh, whose family then remained at Smithfield until emancipation in 1865. The McNorton family uh, was the second family, a very large family, that was here certainly by 1800 and then here in several generations until 1865. Um, the Dandridge family, is another one that was here 
in the late 18th, early 19th century, but then seems to have been only daughters that were left. And so M Margaret Dandridge married uh, Richard Saunders, and so it became the Saunders family. Uh, so the Dandridge Saunders family was, was here, again, starting in the 18th century, probably up until emancipation, uh, and a family, the, the Moon family. Uh, but again, I, again, I don't know when they first got here, but they were certainly here by the 1820s and then here through the end. I wish I knew more about all of them, uh, but the, the, the records are sparse. They did, first of all, you'll notice I use last names. People often think slaves didn't have last names. They did. Um, as far as I can tell in Montgomery County, virtually every slave had a last name. And generally speaking, the white owners knew those names, they just chose not to use them. So when the Prestons, when for example, James Patton Preston died and his slaves were all enumerated in, in the inventory, most of them it's only a first name. But for John Fraction, it says John Fraction. And I suspect that's simply because there were multiple Johns, they wanted to be sure which one they were identifying. Uh, similarly for the McNortons, they put William and then put Muck next to it. So the owners, knew the names, and certainly the enslaved individuals knew their names. They, in fact, their first names were often, from generation to generation, people named their, their children after their parents, named them after their siblings, named them after, uh, just down, right down, and actually, there's currently um, a gentleman named Saunders Moon V. His great, great, great grandfather was Saunders Moon, who was born here as a slave in the 1830s. And that name has continued now for five generations. So these were very, very consciously families. Uh, they, they in some cases had some input in forming those families, but of course they were enslaved. And so ultimately it was the owner who decided who got to marry whom. Uh, but in many cases, and I wish I could say for sure what happened to Smithfield, in many cases it was a matter of the two individuals, man, the, the man and the woman or their families deciding and approaching the owners uh, to ask about marriage. There were certainly cases where it was imposed, where the, where the Prestons or another owner just said, you two, get married. For the families, this was a great source of strength and comfort in the world of enslavement. You know, they were in a world where there were few things they could control themselves, but one of the things over which they had at least some control, or many of the, fa many of the families at Smithfield anyway, was life in their household. Because not all of the families here at Smithfield, but many of the, of, of the ones that I mentioned, um, most of these families were intact on the plantation. So the Fractions and the, and the McNortons, for example, husband and wife both lived here, and as far as I can tell, their immediate children lived here. Their siblings have often been separated. Uh, the, the, the Fractions and the McNortons had been here through multiple generations, and when William Preston, the original builder of the, of the, of the plantation, when he died, the families were divided, and so some of John Fraction's siblings went to Abingdon, Virginia, for example. Some of them went up to Rockbridge County, Virginia. Others went elsewhere. Same with the McNortons. So they had extended family beyond, but the nuclear family for the Fractions and the, and the McNortons was probably here at Smithfield. Um, Margaret Dandridge, Greater, Mar Smithfield. Greater Smithfield, yes. Yeah. Because during the course of their marriage, the families were then divided again when James Patton Preston died. And so some of the McNorton's children went to Whitethorn or to uh, Solitude. Some of the Fraction children went to Whitethorn or to Solitude. Um, the Dandridge family is a, Peggy Dandridge, which you married Richard Saunders. This is an, an example of what's called a broad marriage. Richard Saunders was never at the plant, as far as I can tell, never enslaved at, at Smithfield. He was, uh, he was enslaved elsewhere, but the couple was allowed to marry and apparently allowed visits from time to time because they had numerous children. But Margaret stayed here, and under Virginia law, children passed, their condition passed by the mother, and they were the property of the owner of the mother. And so the Dandridge 
the Saunders children would have been here with their mother. Their father would have been visiting from time to time. The Moon family is another interesting example in that William Moon had at one time been enslaved. Uh, he was a slave in Price's Fork, one of the members of the Price family. And while enslaved, was a, allowed to marry a woman here at Smithfield named Louisa, whose last name I don't know. He was then, William was then set free. Uh, he was emancipated by his owner in the 1830s and came here to work as a hired, as hired labor. And so he lived here as a free man. His wife by then had died. She died in the, in the 1830s. He lived here as a free man with his four sons who were enslaved because they had been born to an enslaved mother. So families here, they're legally a, a range of patterns. But all of them were very strong nuclear families that were critically important to, to, the, to the members of the family. And again, they had no legal standing. So the fact that they were married, no matter how long they'd been married, when if at any time the, the owner chose, wanted to sell them, they would be sold. If at any time the owner died, every enslaved individual knew that when an owner died, the property got divided up. And it must have been one of the most tense times in the slave community for during their lifetimes. Because and here it happened. Um, William Preston, when William Preston died, they actually did two divisions, one in 1806, one in 1816. And then when James Pratt and Preston died in 1841, or 43, excuse me, uh, shortly after his death, they were divided again. I can I, I, I can't even imagine the tension in slave in the enslaved households knowing, oh damn it, here we go again. Uh, because by then, actually, I mentioned the three sons, William, uh, James Patton Preston also had a daughter uh, who lived in Henry County. And at least half a dozen of the enslaved people here at Smithfield were sent to Henry County. Uh, I don't know that any of the fractions went. Uh, Moons and McNortons went off to, to Henry County. Now the family wasn't the only part of community for the, the enslaved workers here. As I said, they, they had formed a hybrid Afro-American community uh, from, from the beginning. That continued right down through the end of slavery. The center of that community would have been what's just called collectively the slave quarters. The, none of the original buildings here at, at Smithfield that housed the enslaved have survived. There's, there's one on the other side of the main house that was moved here from uh, white thorn plantation and probably was not built specifically to, to house enslaved workers. It was originally fairly close to the house, much like if you get out of solitude, um, what's now called the fraction house, is fairly close to the main house. Usually on plantations, buildings that close to the main house were domestic dependencies like kitchens or laundries for the main house in which enslaved workers might live. So at the one here at Solitude, the one here at Smithfield, the one down at Solitude, uh, what it was probably the case that enslaved workers lived upstairs. And that the lower floor was something attached to serving the, the families. The main quarter uh, here at Smithfield was probably about a quarter mile from the main house in, in that direction uh, towards the campus. It was, we don't know, it, it probably changed from time over time. Uh, the only snapshot we have of it is the 1860 census when there were eight, uh, according to the census, eight houses for the enslaved, for enslaved workers. They probably formed a little cluster and in the middle of that, near that somewhere, was probably, is where we think, well we think it was near the, what remains of the Mary tree. Um, again, down the hill from the, from the front of the house, you, you'll be able to see it's about 20 feet tall now, I guess, the, what, the remnants of what had been a centuries-old oak tree. The region of Africa from which the enslaved workers originally came, one of the cultural practices is not to worship trees, but to identify trees as places of spiritual power sometimes inhabited by spiritual beings. 
And these trees become sites for a variety of ceremonies. Uh, it might be simply making an offering to, to the spirits. It might be to celebrate the birth of a child or to mourn the death of, of an elder. Or simply to celebrate having a good day. Um, but the, in, in West African, in many West African cultures, these trees became central places for villages. And we know from one post-war deed that the surviving slave quarters were in that general vicinity. And enough stories have come down both through the enslaved side of the family and the Preston side of the family, designating that as the Mary tree or the Mary oak, that it seems very likely that was the center of the African American community. They would have had homes there, and the, the fact that it was at least a slight distance from the main house and a distance, the overseer had a house, uh, again, about a quarter mile downhill from the quarters. The, the enslaved workers had at least that area free from immediate supervision by their owners or by the overseer. And so it was an area where they could relax to some extent among themselves. They probably had gardens there. Uh, we have no actual documentary record of that, but it was typical on plantations to allow the enslaved and actually to encourage the enslaved to grow part of their own food. Uh, so they would have uh, gardens around, the, around the, the quarters. Again, we don't know if this happened at Smithfield, but it was very common on plantations that member, enslaved workers could sometimes sell surplus food. So if they, what they raised in their gardens, they could eat themselves, or in some cases, perhaps at Smithfield, we don't know for sure, they could then sell it. We do know that enslaved people in Montgomery County did have cash because they belonged to churches, including the, some of the enslaved workers at Smithfield belonged to the Methodist church here in town. And they, they collected in their records, it'll show, white offering, black offering. So the, the African Americans, including those from Smithfield, did have cash they could provide to the church. One source, one possible source of that cash would have been if they were selling garden produce. Again, we don't know for sure if 